<laughs> humans, gentle humans, I've taken way too much time of your time already. Uh, we've got a great show, a great lineup of authors. Without any further ado, let me introduce the very first one. Our next reader is Meg Ellison. is a force of truly heroic proportions. She is, as the poet once wrote of love, uh, vaster than empires and more slow and... I'm sorry, I'm just getting a correction. Apparently our next reader, Meg Ellison, is vaster than empires and also quite a bit faster than they are. Uh, my producers are telling me that actually in 1920 she challenged King George V and the whole British Empire to a foot race and she won by 20 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but is a lot when you're sprinting. And uh, actually this would cause the British Empire to shrink from the largest empire of the world, which it was, to its present size, which is small enough to drown in a teacup. Tea so uh, friends, you can't hide, you can't run, you might as well surrender to our next reader, Meg Ellison! Good evening, everybody. Hi! So the story I'm about to read you is maybe the gayest thing I've ever written. <laughs> Keep your eye on your girlfriend. <laughs> also, I had to text mine and warn her this was coming out. <laughs> if you don't like my delivery, it was published this week by Catapult Story, and you can read it there. <laughs> This is called Going on Dates with Girls, 1989 to 1999. One of the girls who lived on my block told me they were gonna, that we were going to have a fancy business lunch because we were business women. She told me we should both wear suits and carry briefcases. She was a lawyer and I was a senator. This kid, I wish I remembered her name so I could have called her crying after the last election. I don't remember contributing anything to this conversation. I would have had no idea what to say. I remember telling boys exactly what game we were playing, which side they were on, where to go, what to do, and to wait on my signal. It was never that way with girls. I remember she had these brightly colored plastic fish filled with water that we used as ice cubes for our business-like Kool-Aid and translucent tumblers. I wore a cardigan and carried a lunchbox as a briefcase. She kissed me, our mouths both stained red in those long years before lipstick. We chewed on those fish until they busted. We kept a weekly date until her mother saw us doing it, and thereafter, every time I asked if she could play, she told me her daughter wasn't home. She must have been at the office. There was a tow-headed girl child who lived next door whose mother was deaf. They had the first flashing light doorbell I'd ever seen. My girl used to come over when she was hungry, but I didn't really figure that out until years later. I thought she was just really interested in our neighbor's pantries. My mother painted, her mother painted our faces for Halloween, the lines perfect and haunting as she sketched a spiderweb veil over my eye. It was the first time I knew beauty in the mirror, outlined in black lipstick and made believable through abstraction. That woman turned me into a goth, I'm sure of it. Her daughter turned me into something else that summer, out in the long grass out back. We'd grind, fully clothed, breathing hard in each other's faces, and I'd tell her that I loved her. She'd always laugh, but she'd never say it back. They moved out in the middle of the night on the first of the month. There was a girl in junior high whose rather unusual name I have spelled every way I can think of on Facebook to figure out what became of her, but it looks like I'll never know. She wrote a rap about it. I'll never forget it. She taught me how to moisturize on the edges of the playground and told me that we were made for each other. And she could tell, because when we'd sing together in our heads, we'd hear the entire orchestra. She was terrified of her mother, and she never met mine. There was nowhere in the world that we could be free and alone together, and somehow we knew that without ever naming it. Our school held dances about once a month and did not bother with chaperones, so that's where I learned to freak. <laughs> it's not gay if you're upright and Dre is playing, and there are boys somewhere nearby working desperately to get a piece of the action. <laughs> and you never have to tell your mom. 1999 to 2005. The first girl I fell in love with was not a human at all because I would not let her be. She was a goddess and a demon and an archetype, and no wonder we never slept together. I didn't know anything in those days. We got drunk, we got high, I got lovesick and sick of loving her. I had to separate the sigil of desire I'd made her into from the ordinary woman she became. She was the first one to make me say it. Let's pretend we're vampires and say she sired me. That's the way I'll always tell it. The next girl was as disarming and strange as a whirlpool and I had not yet learned to row backwards. She was the first one I let touch me naked, the first one I touched back without fear. She was the first one I told I'd never want anything else, that I'd never go back to men, that this was the answer to the question of who we would be. Her mother was always with us and somehow did not suspect. Our dates were strained and restrained, 
stolen moments pouting sidelong at the straight kids whose parents would admonish but would not forbid. She was dangerous and unstable and I knew that, but I could ignore it until she woke me up in the middle of the night to show me that she had covered the bedroom we shared in stapled up sheets of paper so that she could write an epic poem about murdering me in screaming orange highlighter ink. <laughs> this is not a date. <laughs> Her mother caught us and kicked me out. That is what we used to call a rite of passage. There was a girl I was always in love with, but I never figured out how to do it right. She sat in my lap and told me she wanted me, and still I thought she must have been mistaken. We had good dates, but I could never make good on them. We laid in the grass and looked at the stars. Our local radio station debuted Kid A without interruption, start to finish one evening. She did her makeup perfectly and switched on the fairy lights in her bedroom and made space on her bed for us both. When she reached for my hand, I thought there must be some mistake. When I fell in love with a boy and she would show me her anger simmering under her every word and flowing through her every movement, I knew we'd made a mistake. When she told me she was leaving for college on the other coast, I knew I had. 2005 to 2012. There were women who actually knew what they were doing and thank the gods for them. <laughs> There was a woman who took me to burlesque shows and bought me drinks and whispered filth in my ear while we watched beautiful bodies alight with dance. There was a woman who took me to the kinds of places that hired a lighting designer who filtered golden incandescence through a wall of half-filled tequila bottles. There was a woman who wove her memories of a trip to Rome expertly through a conversation that always felt equal and engaging and fair even though I had never been. I remember watching the way her earrings brushed against her exposed collarbones and knowing that she had planned it so that I would watch just as surely as the skyline of Rome had been built to glorify the sunrise. She taught me what it is to smooth the edges of an experience. She took my hand, ran it over the curves, and told me, look, see, feel, no splinters here. There were women who asked me piercing, insightful questions about myself in a way that never made me feel threatened or belittled, only challenged. There were women who insisted we order dessert and never mentioned calories or working out or ascribed any kind of moral worth to what we put into our mouths at dinner or afterwards. There were women in whose beds I would awaken with wordless gratitude for all that I had learned. These were the years when I learned what going on dates was supposed to be like. Money makes some parts of it easier and more enjoyable. Moving to a city gives one more options. But the better part of my education was learning that a date is an opportunity to know and be known to share pleasure publicly and hold hands and appreciate that we are the luckiest creatures on earth. I grew up and the world grew up at the same time. Other women have had this experience, I'm sure, but not like us millennial queers have. It's a universal stupidity to believe that everything is new as it newly occurs to us. But our closets got open from the outside and we got encouraged to come out. None of the generations of queers who came before us can say the same. We aren't all safe, we aren't all out, and there are still plenty of places where we cannot hold hands without keeping the other one free to defend ourselves and our dates. Still, by the time I was a real adult, there was no law that could be used against us. I have dated long enough to see a change, and I am still young enough to work at the craft. 2012 to present. I know how to do it now. Despite the way they say our generation doesn't go on dates, only hooks up, and is killing the casual dining chain, and is putting off getting married, and is never having kids, we who have been in school all these years have surely graduated. We just expect a date worth going on. I know how it is to have a fancy business lunch. I never ran for Senate and I don't drink Kool-Aid anymore. But I remember how to set expectations, bring the colorful fish, and read the room. I never get kicked out by mothers these days. I found the girl I never got it right with and I showed her what I've learned over oysters and gin. Kid A doesn't cut it for either of us on this side of the timeline, but we also don't have to hide. I found the archetype girl and I grinned at her over bread bowls with clam chowder and coffee with a siren on the cup. And I assured her that she's not basic, that I forgive us both for growing up, that I've always wanted to be able to do this. So I do. I caught up with the women who taught me how to do it for real. I returned the favor, talking not about Rome, but about the books I write and making sure never to steamroll them, to stay coy, to stay interesting. I told them that I learned it from them. They said that it was nothing, that it was just conversation, that this is just what people do. They're half right. Thank you. Larry Ellison's billionaire daughter has an extra L, and it's to conceal her weakness. <laughs> just so everyone, someday I'm gonna learn how to use a mic stand. <laughs> he wants to love you. <laughs>
<laughs> no. Lewis, I learned this. Sure around, not on. Oh. <laughs> do you want to do this? I have a script. Come up here. You're gonna come for me like this. Our next reader is Lynette Solandazo. Woo! <laughs> Make some noise. Uh, but Miami could not contain her. Uh, she began performing in Chicago, but Chicago could not control her. She's moved to the Bay Area, and delightful as that is, she's put us all in mortal danger. Because of the booty. You see, Lynette likes to shake her booty. I asked for some details to do with these bios, and the booty was uh, not just mentioned in these details, it was a recurring theme. Uh, Lynette insists upon shaking her booty, but folks, I have to warn you, the booty is too powerful. Uh, geologists have linked 80% of recent Bay Area earthquakes to Lynette booty incidents, and every emergency manager from here to Gilroy has nightmares of waking up at 3 in the morning to receive the cold, cold Solandazo call. If she bottles it up for even a week, the disaster when the booty is unleashed could be cataclysmic. So put your hands together and make some rhythm for our next reader, Lynette Solandazo! Yeah, if I don't like shake it, I get upset. Yeah. Woo! 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 Yeah, um, let's give it up for this space and this event and every motherfucker in here. I knew there was not going to be light, and fuck it. Okay. <laughs> I'm driving back from the Redlands, Miami-Dade Redlands, not here Redlands. It sucks because I'm drunk as shit right now, and I'm probably blacked out. The Redlands is where my family goes for the holidays. One big, dysfunctional, alcoholic, codependent family in the middle of the farms. Mind you, we're not farmers. <laughs> Somehow, I'm back home in Coconut Grove, La Sauicera. Bro, I don't live in Hialeah, my childhood home. Just three to five minutes from downtown Miami. It depends if you're in a Honda Civic that's souped up, that's three minutes. If you're in a dunk, it's 10 minutes. <laughs> I stumble in, I pass out. Now it's Black Friday, just kidding. It's still Thanksgiving Thursday. <laughs> I didn't eat my abuela's pumpkin flan because I'm on this no sugar, no white flour, restrictive diet under the guise of a spiritual program that has me feeling pretty shitty. Without all the sugar from the flan and with all the alcohol, there is no way I'm staying put tonight. I hit up my friend Diango, my best friend in the whole entire world. Bro, we're going to the Grove. Footnote, this is Miami and this was Miami. We say bro no matter what. Not to be confused with bruh that y'all use here, like the Bay Area bruh, no. Bro is used by Miamians an average of 40 to 358 times a day. Bro can be used for excitement, confusion, anger, elation, sadness, disgust, concern. I'm about to be in my pants, hurry up, bro. Yes, I'm aware of how masculine bro is. But when you live in a predominantly machisto society, bro is literally the least of your worries. Diango lets me know, yeah, no, for sure, bro. That meant yes. It's super on. Our destination, the Grove, our desired result, to get tore up from the floor up. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> he knows. My getting ripped. My getting ready rituals include showering, applying makeup, shaving my legs, thighs included, because I'm wearing this like shorter dress, so like you have to take care of the thigh legs, the thigh hairs. Also drinking booze in the shower and masturbating. Yes. Yes. People who masturbate before going out are single. <laughs> So you get, you get. I have avoided serious relationships most of my life because quite frankly, I love really hard and the only conveniences I enjoy are late night bodega trips. It was a routine masturbation before a night out. Post shower, I'm naked. You know how the story goes. You're turned on and then 30 seconds later, you just wanna get the fuck off. <laughs> You're telling yourself, shut the fuck up so that you can come. Shut the fuck up, bitch. <laughs> 
it happened. I came and I fucked up my neck. It was 2008, but this created a different emotion from 2002's hit song, My Neck, My Back by Kia. Bro, my neck was all the way fucked up. Like, I couldn't turn my head, like, I couldn't drive. Like, I'm gonna call it a night and heal and stay home. Suddenly, I was magically transported with my loud, bassy music and my black Toyota Corolla and Diango to the Grove. We began our journey at Fat Tuesdays. For those of you not familiar with the finer things in life, Fat Tuesdays is a chain bar that specializes in frozen drinks and forgotten nights. I have to say, if you do jump in the Honda Civic in the sky and fly to Miami, you won't find it. It's been demolished. But for tonight, we'll be there together. It's a cold Miami night, imagine it, balmy and breezy, a chilly, chilly, chilly 70. You can sniff the air, that's a, that's a trigger because of the air right now, you can, I know. but let's pretend. You can sniff the air because it's filled with men's cologne, coconut oil, rum, vodka, Pinsa Fabuloso, that purple cleaner that you get at bodegas if you don't know, sweat. Expensive lease BMW car leather that belongs to a 35 year old man that lives with his mom. <laughs> sniff it. Sniff every last drop. Drink every tequila and Diet Coke. And also Coke. Have you ever smelled Coke? You'll be awake for a while and want to fuck yourself and your ex. <laughs> we don't drink the frozen drinks at Fat Tuesdays, but we drink a lot. Diango brought the boys men, if you will. We all lived with our parents. Don't judge us. We're under 25 Cuban, Nicaraguan, and Colombian. You can get fucked up and come home drunk, but don't you dare move out of your mom's house. <laughs> you can get fucked up, tell your mom she's a piece of shit, but don't you dare move out. <laughs> we contemplated life's meaning that night, drank our sorrows, pretended there was no future, no past, just now, one of those nights where life just becomes easy. My neck didn't hurt anymore. <sighs> and I romantically grayed out. So of course, we were suddenly somewhere else, at Sandbar, a beach-themed bar where Wednesday nights you can get penny beers. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm the kind of drunk when I think I'm in a movie, so now I think I'm in Dirty Dancing Little Havana Nights, dancing with my homies, homie Carlos. Nothing is better than dancing with someone that wants to dance with you. Carlos and I are spinning effortlessly to Joe Arroyo's La Jerilón, and all of a sudden, it was three in the morning. Calabaza, calabaza, todo el mundo pa' su casa. Google Translate translated this saying as squash pumpkin all over world for your house. <laughs> so I go, kill me, but that's not it. What Calabaza Calabaza is trying to say, hello, it's time for everyone to go to their respective home. Carlos left home without me, and it's just me and Dee at the drive through at Taco Bell. Because for me, home is off US 1 and 32nd Avenue at almost 4 a.m. If you thought I was about to describe what I ate at Taco Bell almost 10 years ago, <laughs> when I was grayed out with my neck fucked up because I masturbated too hard, <laughs> and I spent the night with my pretend boyfriend, Carlos, from Hialeah, you're absolutely right. I do remember my Taco Bell order. <laughs> I got a chicken soft taco, two of them, the nacho supreme and fire hot sauce. <laughs> because you know I like it rough, hot, and with a kink in my neck. <laughs> Lynette, tell the folks where they can find your work. Um, on Instagram, Traveling Chonga, that's C-H-O-N-G-A, or Lynette Salandazo on Facebook. Thanks.
Our next reader, Aya de Leon, teaches creative writing at UC Berkeley. Kensington Books publishes her award-winning feminist ice series, Justice Hustlers. <laughs> you thought I wasn't going to say that real hard. You were incorrect <laughs> about what I am honor-bound to do when the script says, Justice Hustlers. <laughs> Uptown Thief, 2016. The Boss, 2017. The Accidental Mistress, 2018. And in 2019, Sidekick Nation about the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Yeah, make some noise. <laughs> Award Women Feminist Heist series. I've written zero award women feminist women feminist heist novels. That's like the human average. Four is inconceivable. It's, it's, you don't realize what that's like. It's so many standard deviations. It's so many standard deviations. It's like eight of them. I never, I didn't do great in statistics. She has received a claim in the Washington Post. The Village Voice and the SF Chronicle, Aya is at work on two suspense novels. Number one, Operation Hologram, about FBI infiltration of an African-American political organization. When could that have happened? And two, a black spy girl book for teens called Going Dark. She blogs and tweets at Aya, at, at Aya de Leon and AyaDeLeon.com. Everybody make some noise for Aya de Leon! Hi, girls. Hi. Hey. hey, okay, I um, am writing this series, and so I'm going to read a couple of beginnings. Uh, the first one is for family. So this is the beginning of The Accidental Mistress, which is about two sisters who are immigrants from Trinidad. One is good, and one is bad. Prologue, November. Lily had always been trouble. But Violet knew something was really wrong when she heard a strange man yelling her sister's name. It was early afternoon and Violet was standing at the Manhattan cruise terminal where some of their largest vessels came to dock. In front of her, a giant ship loomed quiet and empty. On this unseasonably warm November day, Violet breathed in the briny smell of polluted New York water and heard the swish and hiss of water sloshing around and below her. Across the cream-colored bow, Elite Cruises was written in dark gold script. Along the lower half of the ship's side, dark windows dotted the outer wall like a triple strand of onyx beads. Above that, several stories of balconies stretched across the length of the ship. A shirtless black man appeared at the railing. Lily! He bellowed. Violet looked around but didn't see her sister. Much further down the ship's side, a hydraulic metal gangplank stretched from the belly of the vessel to the cement dock. The man continued yelling, Lily, but what a rust! He was dark and firmly muscled, cursing in Jamaican patois down at someone Violet couldn't see. Lily, you losers! I want a blood clot, do ya? Two days before, Violet had gotten a message from her sister via ship-to-shore call. Lily's voice had sounded bright and bubbly. She was coming to New York, and she gave the exact date, time, and location for Violet to meet her. Spontaneous, crazy, practically no notice, typical Lily. As kids, Violet had always chased after her reckless little sister and tried to keep her out of trouble. Violet had left for boarding school at 14 and had been 12 years since they had seen each other in person. Now, suddenly, Lily was whizzing down the gangplank on a tandem bicycle. Violet echoed the, Jama the Jamaican man's curses in U.S. English. What the fuck? Lily got closer. She was wearing a beige maid's uniform and flip-flops. She, pull she pulled up to Violet and screeched to a stop. Get on! Lily said, indicating the rear seat of the bicycle built for two. If that crazy yachty catches us, he'll kill me and you too for good measure. In the distance, Violet saw the shirtless man running down the gangplank to give chase. Violet was dressed for work, wearing wedge sandals and a long A-line dress. She hiked the dress up in one fist and climbed onto the bike. The sisters began to pedal. Violet's feet were unsteady in the high heels. Fortunately, cruise season was winding down and there were few pedestrians. They only had to swing wide to avoid an elderly woman walking a dog. At the corner, the light changed to green and they turned onto a busy commercial Manhattan street. 
Unfortunately, the traffic was one way, headed toward them. You're gonna get us killed! Violet screamed, watching the line of vehicles bearing down on them. She shut her eyes, expecting to feel the impact of a delivery truck crushing their bodies against a parked car or hurling them into the street, but miraculously, Lily managed to avoid the line of swift cars. Violet's eyes flew open as she could feel the bike leaning dangerously to the left. As they rounded a corner, they, she gripped the handles even tighter and clenched her body onto the bike. At least they were moving with traffic now, and the cars didn't look like potential executioners. Damn, Violet! Her sister yelled over her shoulder. Will you pedal? I'm trying to put as much space between me and that lunatic tick as possible. Violet began to pedal. Um, Violet began to pedal down the long block between the avenues. When this was over, if they didn't both get killed, she vowed to personally wring her sister's neck. <laughs> Stores and restaurants flashed by as they sped along the sidewalk, crowded with pedestrians. Behind them, they heard a siren. Could that bastard have called the police? Lily asked. Did you commit a crime? Violet asked. On the jumping ship, Lily said. But he knows that if the police catch me without papers, I'll get deported. I don't fucking believe this, Violet said. The police car turned down the turned down their block but got caught by, for a moment behind a garbage truck. Lily turned the corner on the far end of the block. Break! She yelled to Violet. Both women squeezed the handbrakes. The bike stopped abruptly. Violet lurched into her sister's back, banging her ribs painfully on the handlebars. Lily leapt up off the bike and yanked Violet behind her as the bicycle clattered to the ground in front of a temporary Halloween costume shop. <laughs> Lily, what the hell is going on? Violet asked. I just immigrated, Lily said and strolled into the store. <laughs> Mistress, I like to open with chase scenes, um, but with the new with the new book. So this is Side Chick Nation, which is about the hurricane in Puerto Rico, um, and it. Uh, I wrote a chase scene, but I felt like I needed uh, something hurricaney before that. So this is the prologue. Um, our girl here, um, Dulce, is in Puerto Rico, and she's not from there. Um, she's Dominican, but she is in Puerto Rico and was trying to get out and couldn't get out, so she's in a storage space, kind of squatting in the storage space to wait out the hurricane. Oh, trigger warning, uh, flashbacks of sexual and domestic violence. Prologue. Water flooded the storage space as Luce slept. It seeped up through the metal slats in the pull-down door. It pooled on the concrete floor. It rose around the mattress where Dulce was sleeping. Although not exactly sleeping, more like in a stupor or a spell from the cocktail of rum and marijuana, it dulled her hearing so she didn't startle with the shrieking of the winds and battering rain and thudding of broken branches against the building. It dulled the panic she would have felt alone in a storage space where she was living illegally in a hurricane and nobody knew she was there. Water seeped up turning the mattress into a giant sponge. Soon her back was wet, the crisscross of her racerback tank top, the cotton shorts, the moisture seeped up into the fabric. Even above the surface of the water she lay in, inch by inch, the line crept up her feet, her beautifully painted blue toenails, the sides of her arms and legs, hips and torso. It soaked her hair, destroying the remains of the blowout she'd been trying to conserve. She had sweated out the roots, but the tips of her hair had stayed somewhat straight, even in the humidity. She kept she kept it in a ponytail over the last few days, so the ends didn't erupt into tight curls from the sweat on her back and shoulders. But now the water rose just above the mattress, soaking her hair, and it bloomed into springing curls all around her head. Still, she slept. It wasn't until the water seeped into her ears that her body moved at all beyond the rise and fall of her chest. Her shoulders flinched with the moisture, tickling her ear canal, but it didn't wake her. First one side, then the other, as her head was slightly tilted in the, on the mattress, no pillow. 
But then both ears filled and the tickle was gone, her body stilled again in sleep, the now full ear canals dulling the howls of the storm. The flooding outside was anything but gentle, yet the water could only seep in through the slats in the metal door, the crack at the bottom just above the cement floor, so the water level rose slowly. It crept up gently along her neck, her jawline, her cheekbone. The water sidled up tenderly, like a lover. Dulce slept like a maiden awaiting a prince, awaiting a kiss. Yet she slept on when the water first touched her lips, only when it began to seep into her mouth did she slowly stir the water pooling at the back of her throat and making it impossible to breathe properly now. The prince had come, the rescuer on his horse, the discoverer, the pimp. She flashed back in the choke of the water. She recalled her pimp's hands around her throat, the bruising press of his fingers against skin and muscle and tendon and windpipe. As the flood water of the hurricane tickled delicately into her throat, her body recalled the more searing pain of constricted breath, the scrabbling panic of asphyxiation, her heart hammering frantically as if it needed to escape her body in order to survive, then the half blackout feeling her body slump to the floor, the wince with the sharp press of his boot toe as he delivered a single kick to her hip, her hip now soaked in the flood water, the left hip. Her pelvis was tilted slightly and her left side pointed down toward the sodden mattress. Her right side, side was slightly raised, the hip bone jutting above the water line like a disappearing island of brown skin as water pooled between the tops of her thighs. Yet she could feel that the real th threat was at her throat again, like the one time, like like the other time when her pimp had send, sent one of his thugs to kill her. The man had a knife at her throat as a few dozen women and some of their kids looked on in horror. She had stood outside the shelter on the icy Manhattan ground in bare socks, numb with terror, unable to feel the freezing concrete beneath her feet. Again, the press at her throat, the knife threatening not only skin and muscle and tendon and windpipe, but now her carotid in jeopardy as well. More water trickled into her throat and she coughed weakly, her gag reflex still kicking, and with the gagging, part of her brain began to register the fact that her life was in danger. Some fight or flight response activated her tongue, dragging it into action to spit out some of the water her life in danger. Her body struggled to wake but couldn't quite push through her half-dreaming stupor in which the unbidden memory bloomed in her mind like a nightmare. The time she had been fool enough to go back to her pimp and he'd thrown her against the wall, paint and plaster crashing into her back and shoulder like a drunk driver. When she staggered to her feet, he choked her, his thick fingers more insistent than ever this time despite her own hands, gripping his wrists, digging her fingernails into his skin, trying in vain to open the vice of his oppositional thumbs, yet it was her own grip she could feel loosening, and she began losing consciousness. That had been Dulce's breaking point, the moment she decided to leave him for good, or rather, she passed out fearing that she might die, and, but deciding to live if she found she had a choice. That same resolve woke her inside the storage unit. She sputtered to life, coughing through a burning throat in total darkness, completely soaked, her body sluggish and disoriented with the marijuana and the residuals of rum. She tried to lift her head, but her hair was unexpectedly weighted down with water. Slowly through the chemical fog, she rolled to her side. As if in slow motion, she dragged an arm beneath her to prop herself up on one elbow. She coughed and gagged, suddenly vomiting, yet the retching made her a bit more lucid. Even in the total darkness, she was able to orient herself to make some sense of the bizarre combination of mattress and moisture, screaming winds, and crashing thuds in the darkness. Storage space, hurricane, flooding, Thank you. Make more noise! Can I tell these folks where they can get a hold of your work? Um, 
the Justice Hustlers books are available all the places where books are sold online at IndieBound, Powell's, and Amazon. And um, a lot of the bookstores carry them. I know in the East Bay, um, Pegasus in Berkeley keeps them stocked. Thank you. Yeah. One more round of applause. Our next reader, Lauren Parker, uh, flies like paper and gets high like planes. Uh, and this is true. And gentle reader, uh, you may therefore expect that all she wants to do is boom, 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 and, and uh, take your money. Fun story about this. Lyric sites cannot agree on how to transcribe those sounds. I did some research. <laughs> But if you think that all Lauren wants to do is boom, 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 and, a and take your money, uh, nothing could be further from the truth, for your money is meaningless to her socialist soul. And a simple firearm is as nothing to her. Nothing. It is like a toothpick to Baduhenna, ancient Germanic goddess of war. I did several kinds of research for this bio. <laughs> Lauren is fly like paper, high like planes, and she's dropping bombs. Truth and beauty bombs and justice bombs and feminism bombs and anarchy bombs and poetry bombs and no shelter on this earth can stop them. So put your hands together for the word queen of war, Lauren Parker! And thank you all for coming. So, because uh, it's family dinner, and because uh, I didn't want to see my family this year, I thought I would read this essay about my dad and really kind of steer into those feelings. So, <laughs> you're all me work it through. The winter before my parents' divorce was final, I was 16, and my father was taking it badly. He'd gone from hostile and absent to desperate, and we'd spend evenings isolated in his battered Chevy Tahoe. The soundtrack, to, soundtrack of his grief was a song by George Jones. Any country music fans? Anybody? Woo! All right. Some people's dads are obsessed with B-sides and obscure tracks, but my dad was cliche and jumped at the chance to play He Stopped Loving Her Today, one of George Jones' most famous hits, over and over. Hitting the back button on the CD deck as the last couple notes would fade out. Help me get your mom back, he said, as the cab of the Chevy filled up with mournful lines like, he kept her picture on his wall, went half crazy now and then. He still loved her through it all, hoping she'd come back again. I didn't say anything. Things were best if I didn't say anything. I sat in his truck, bouncing over the ragged pavement, my ears full of George's story, hoping we wouldn't be gone for too many hours this time. I don't envy a country man's muse. It has terrible payoff. You're only important when you're gone. This is the best country song ever written, he'd say, and then sing, she said you'll forget in time, his notes flattening on the yule. Then he'd fall silent for the remaining three minutes and 17 seconds. I'd been encouraging my mom to leave since I was 12, and had gone from sympathetic to glacial, dwelling on my discomfort so deep and sharp I couldn't predict where it ended. He was never as interested in me as he was in about losing my mother. I'd scoop closer to the window, the seatbelt digging into the side of my cheek, trying to imagine living in the rooms of the lit farmhouses we'd pass. I wondered how others coped with being the woman in the song who hadn't left yet. Like most country songs, He Stopped Loving Her Today is a tale of a woman leaving a man. His parting words are the thing or that he will love her until he dies. It lacks other country themes, no trucks, no dogs, no Budweiser, but it does have six chords and the truth. My childhood was spackled together with dismissive platitudes. It is what it is, and I am what I am. It's hard to figure out who you are in the shadow of so much certainty, reaching out from under my father's darkness to get enough light to grow. There are bars in this town where you'd encounter a fist to the face for shitting on George Jones. He Stopped Loving Her Today is his biggest hit, and after almost a decade of a failing career, frayed and cracked from years of blue-collar alcoholism enabled by top-shelf money. George's voice wasn't what it once was, misshapen and rough, the notes cut their way out of his throat. It shot up the charts on debut and re-emerged the week of his death to hit number 21. The whole album volleys between shameful resignation and throwing up his hands, telling you that what you see is what you get. To this day, the song sneaks up on me, moving through the world like my father's moods. 
There are women that don't make it into country songs. The most important part of He Stopped Loving Her Today is what's been left out. It's the cavernous vacancies of the story, the ownership, the responsibility. Country, for all its painstaking honesty, never tells us why women leave. Just that a man stuck it out until the very end. Saving letters and keeping pictures, mixing bitterness with his bitters. Picking at wounds until they swell and warm with infection. They don't write country songs about me. No one writes about their 16-year-old daughter who just wants them to do something to make loving them worth it. My father's relationship with George Jones is better than his relationship with me. It's easy to love people who don't need anything from you. It's easy to love an old drunk with a guitar. It's easy to love a voice carrying through a sound system. I'm hard to love. My father poured over the same fights, kept pushing repeat. I wasn't the same every time. My needs didn't fit into meter chorus. Our fights looped in my head, stuck like a groove in the record. My dad holds vigil for a wife he made up, telling stories edited where he is the hero. My father treasures the past, asking about friends from years ago, hanging on to broken furniture, outdated technology, and rusty farm equipment. His voice holds the clipped Midwestern consonants and drawn out vowels of his father and he holds on to hurts with the same reverence as joy. My list of transgressions became too long, not wearing a dress to my graduation pictures, not picking up every time he called, not being able to do math in my head, not asking him for help. My father being in touch with his emotions made him more articulate of all the things I didn't live up to. George Jones died in 2013. I was living in the mountains of New Hampshire, and I hadn't spoken to my father in a full year. For 24 hours, I could not listen to a single radio station without hearing George's gravelly lilt crooning, and all I could think was, motherfucker, I loved him, and he didn't do anything to keep me. The day after my college graduation, my father took me out for ice cream and asked me to unpack everything he did that hurt me. I rolled out the pain, cataloging actions and reactions that made me feel unsafe, and he punctuated everyone with, well, I'm your dad. He nods in time, but can't carry the tune of my hurts. He's done his part, lived up to the brutality of feeling, played out the role of misunderstood lonesome, and will be buried a hero. He's a country dad, and his story is the saddest because to him, I'm the one that left. I can't speak for Honky Tonk Angels, but it's hard to abandon what wasn't really there. I listened to George Jones in the luxury of silence, quiet, something my father could never give me. This is my own kind of masochistic drive through the back roads of my fraught teenage years, dredging my own riverbed to find pieces of us within the notes. If I see myself in the song, it means maybe he hasn't stopped loving me until they carry him away. Another promise kept by a country man. The love of country men is hollow, a white flag. I love my father. Love encourages you to do things you shouldn't. It's why we hunt it. We want permission to give people as much of ourselves as we can. We want to withhold and take someone for granted and then give them a song. We can hide in the vulnerability of art. I can't change what can't be changed, but I'm still gonna try. And so I try with George. Because if I hear my father in those notes, then maybe I can keep a country promise. At the end of the song, the lost love returns to attend this man's funeral. After she had preyed upon his mind, she returns to suffer the judgment of the singer. I am gearing up to be that woman, sorting through the mementos and strange altars to a relationship that never was, underlining in red every single I love you. Because he doesn't have love letters or artifacts of me. Maybe pictures taken by my grandmother, but he never thought to keep those things. And the projection of a childhood, childhood he didn't have. And I was supposed to live for him. I don't know if I prey upon his mind, if he's still listening to that song, still repeating those fights, or if he's finally over me for good. Thank you. Bold move offering to talk to people in actual space. <laughs> It's not very millennial of you, Lauren. <laughs> True story, I was in a, a like a 10-person rooming group senior year of college, and I was the only person, and this was years ago, I was the only person in that group willing to call a human on the phone and order a pizza. <laughs> so depending on how 
how old that makes you feel or think I am, that's, uh, that's, I don't know. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> Folks, our last reader tonight is John William. John was born uh, during a hundred year storm, and at that time, Olivia Newton John, no relation, uh, her song Physical was the number one song in the country. And that's kind of ironic, because shortly after birth, John transcended the physical world and entered into a realm of pure feeling. Now he presides over the court of feels as its crown prince, royal jester, and also prime minister. It's a poorly organized monarchy. <laughs> if you've ever had a positive emotion, that's him. If you've ever felt moved by a sunset, also him. If you've ever had like a weird crying jag in the middle of the workday and I had to sneak off to the office bathroom so that no one would see. That's not him. That's his evil emo twin, Shmon Schmillium. And John is a just and kindly king. So now, oh audience, render thy obeisance to the emperor of emotion, the sultan of sentiment, John William. Um, if you guys ever get a chance to have Lewis introduce you, please do it. <laughs> Uh, and thank you all for not letting a little thing like the apocalypse stop you from coming out to enjoy some smut. Um, I'm going to read a sexy story about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, because the world is literally burning down around us, so why the fuck not? He's either a doctor or my husband. He's sitting behind a desk, so I'm thinking doctor, but there's no stethoscope. He has a beard. I know Eddie has a beard. Ellen, the doctor or Eddie says, I know I've been somewhere else when they say my name like that, staring for too long at nothing and they needed to snap me back to the present. Ellen, a little while ago, I asked you to remember three words. Can you tell me what they were? Is your name Eddie? I asked him. I hadn't meant to say this out loud, but not saying things out loud isn't exactly my strong suit these days. There's not so much space between thinking and doing as there used to be. He tells me, one of the words was a piece of furniture. Do you remember which word was a piece of furniture? Was it a bed? I wink at him when I say this. Not so much space between thinking and doing. <laughs> it was a piece of furniture that starts with a T, he says. T, T, titties, I tell him. <laughs> he shifts in his seat and stifles a smile. Doctor or husband, it's fun to watch him squirm. The second word was a piece of fruit. Do you remember the word that was a piece of fruit? It starts with a P. P, P. Peach, I say, and for an instant there's an actual flash of remembering. I still get them from time to time. His face brightens as he tells me I'm right, and we move on to the next word. He asks several more questions, tells me to repeat a phrase, has me count backwards by sevens. Start at 100, he says, and just keep subtracting. And then a woman, a nurse or my sister, comes to take me outside to a street that is paved in gray linoleum. It's not really a street, it's a trick. A hallway made to look like a street, lined with facades that are actually just rooms. Fake schoolhouse, fake post office, fake stoplight that directs no traffic because we have no traffic. They did it all to make a strange place feel <coughs> familiar, and I only fall for it sometimes. Ellen, the nurse or my sister says, snapping me back. Do you want to go to your room? No, I tell her, because people live in houses, not rooms. I think I'd like to be outside for a while. She walks me to a bench, plastic, made to look like wood, and I sit and look up at a sputtering sun in a painted sky. Is your name Carol? I ask the woman who brought me here, but she's no longer there. Carol is my sister. This is a fact. I know many facts about myself. It's all the pictures that are gone. I know Carol is three years older than me, and I know that when I was 16, she showed me how to water down Dad's whiskey so that he couldn't tell we'd been drinking it. But I have no memory of this, and I'm pretty sure I've never met her. 
She could be anyone, and anyone could be her. So it's always a good idea to ask. <laughs> Sometimes I know into the future. I know I will get married in my mother's wedding dress, and Eddie will spill champagne down my back, and I'll try every remedy in good housekeeping to get the stain out until the lace falls apart in my hands. And he tells me to just throw the damn thing out. After all, we got it for free. Excuse me, someone says. A woman, maybe my sister, shudders up to me on a walker. Mind if I sit here as she's already sitting? Are you Carol, I ask? She looks at me, her eyes roomy, searching, aggressive. Then they soften. I'm Alice, she says. Are you waiting for the bus? I am, I say. It's a guess, but a reasonably good one. I know an Alice who waits for a bus. Her father works with my father, and we wait together most days for a bus that takes us to school. She looks to be old, too old to be waiting for a school bus, but I think so do I. Papery skin, soft like expensive leather. I place my hand on hers, and she looks at me with sea glass eyes. Alice is the first girl I know to get breasts. A tiny flash of remembering, the curve of Alice's breast beneath a forest green sweater, one row ahead of me, a desk to the left, Ellen, the teacher says, because I've been staring too long at Alice. The rest of the class giggles and my face burns. I'm suddenly nervous to be sitting next to her waiting for the bus. <laughs> and then, my hand is on Alice's breast. <laughs> I hadn't meant to do this, but these days there isn't much space between thinking and doing. I don't take it away. You're one of those girls, she says. <laughs> I'm not. I <laughs> it's a fact I know about myself. <laughs> but my hand is still on her breast. <laughs> to <t> titties. <laughs> and then her hand is on top of mine, and I'm worried that the other kids will see us when the bus comes. She takes my hand and slides it inside her unbuttoned blouse. How did it get that way, I wonder, <laughs> as her nipple perks between my fingertips and I want very badly to take it in my mouth. But she's kissing me just then. I close my eyes, her lips press my lips gently apart. A papery hand on the side of my neck strokes back a lock of hair. A papery hand under my baggy sweatshirt, thumbs skating circles under and around. A papery hand tumbling down beneath the waistband of my sweatpants, stroking thumbing circles. That's too many hands. <laughs> One of them may be mine. <laughs> You're one of those girls, she says. I open my eyes in time to see her smirk. I giggle and my face burns. She is still wrist deep in my gray sweatpants, the ones with a little dry tapioca from at least a day ago. <laughs> and for a moment I'm old again, but only for a moment. I try to speak, but she has me by the hand and her sea glass eyes. I offer a short smile and beg her to continue. Her fingers wander, no space between thinking and doing, no space between her skin and mine, just currents of raw energy. And I know in the future it won't be like this. With Eddie, it doesn't feel like this. What a gift to not remember all the times I'll lie there as he shakes and grunts on top of me, to not remember his rough, oily skin like cheap leather, all those nights taken away as if they never happened? A whole life that never happened start at 100 and just keep subtracting until there is only this feeling, this thing that the past has stolen back from the present, a new first time. Helen, Carol says, not Carol, a nurse, snapping me back to the present. Do you want to go back to your room? Down the hall, a woman shudders along on a walker. 
Amelia, Alicia, something that starts with an A, but I'm pretty sure I've never met her. I have to see the doctor today, I tell the nurse. It's a guess, but a reasonably good one. You already saw the doctor, she says. Let's get you back to your room. She takes me gently by the arm, and for a moment, I'm old again, but only for a moment. Thank you. hard because I'm a Luddite and not on social media, but uh, you can find four very filthy stories of mine in the shipwreck anthology that came out. Yeah. It's called uh, Loose Lips. Yeah. yeah Who else is in it, Lewis? <laughs> I don't know, a lot of folks. A lot of folks, that's what an anthology means, man. There are a lot of people who are in it. <laughs> And it's cool. It's a cool book. It's, uh, it's fine. I sent it to my mom. <laughs> Folks, this has been Glitterary Salon! Yeah. <laughs>